Hi, we're out on the range today, so please bear with gunfire you hear in the background. And today's presentation is one that you really do have to watch the whole thing. Now, Halloween is coming up very soon, and this time of year always brings up the topic of zombies and the best guns to eliminate them. And this topic seems to be very important to some people, so here we are. But it comes with a couple of caveats, one being that depending on which fictional source you look at, there are different types of zombies, and I'm going to limit myself to that type that requires spinal column damage to disable them, or brain damage to, for lack of a better word, kill them. Also, in any zombie uprising, most people will either have been eaten by the zombies, or they will be zombies, so there'll be very few of you left. And with those parameters established, let me show you my top five anti-zombie guns. Many animals travel in groups, and those groups can have colorful names, like a pod of whales, or a gaggle of geese, or a murder of crows. But because zombies travel in hordes, and because most people will be dead, you'll be greatly outnumbered. Thus, magazine capacity is very important. And because zombies have to be shot in the head, ballistic power is not as important as it would be if you were, say, living in a Planet of the Apes fantasy. So with that in mind, the first gun on my list is the Ruger 10-22 caliber 22 long rifle so you can carry lots of very light ammunition. Mine has a 25 shot magazine, but 30 or even 50 shot magazines are available. And a lot of people ask about the peep sight. That's made for a Thompson Center Hawk and muzzle loading rifle. I just attached it to the 1022 with wood screws and shimmed it in place with duct tape. So let's shoot it. Not bad, even though I've been drenched in zombie blood. Some people will say that they don't want to use a 22 long rifle, which is interesting because while we're talking about zombies, they'll cling to the reality that rimfire is not as reliable as centerfire. Then go back to the fantasy that a 22 long rifle just couldn't kill anything. Well, for those people, I've got the Polish PPS 43 CS in caliber 7.62 by 25, which is centerfire and certainly more powerful than a 22 long rifle. Now, the PPS-43CS is the closed-bolt, semi-automatic, commercially available version of an Eastern Bloc submachine gun. And because this one has the barrel extension, so it's over 16 inches long, it's okay to have the folding stock. And these guns are typically equipped with a 35-shot magazine. So let's shoot it. Well, it certainly seems effective. I want to take a break from the top five and discuss two formats that I think are worthy of honorable mention, and that's pump shotguns and double action revolvers. Now, I talked about the importance of magazine capacity. There's also the importance of being able to reload quickly, and these two formats seem like they'd be the antithesis of that, but they are very important for anti-zombie purposes. Let me explain why. Most auto-loading pistols are what we call blowback operated. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So when propellant combustion starts forcing that projectile down the barrel, there's force moving backwards as well, the blowback that cycles firing. Some rifles, like the 1022 and the PPS 43 CS that we've already seen, are blowback operated, but a lot of rifles are what we call gas operated. Now that's a different system but it's still dependent on a certain amount of pressure being built up at a certain time to force your bolt back and cycle the fire. So how does that apply to anti-zombie purposes? When you're shooting blanks, there is no pushback, there is no gas pressure built up, and so it won't cycle auto-loading firearms. Anybody who's ever been in the military has worked with a blank firing adapter, but you can't have a blank firing adapter hanging off the front of your firearm in a fantasy television show. You have to have a blank adapter that makes it look like real rounds are being fired. Such things are difficult to install, they're expensive, they're time consuming, and a lot of the firearms just won't work as reliably with blanks as they would with live ammunition. So in fantasy television shows, pump shotguns and revolvers that can just be loaded with blanks and fired still have a really big place. 
Now, on the subject of anti-zombie handguns, high capacity is important, but there's no replacement for shot placement. And some people can shoot revolvers more accurately than autoloaders. But for the great majority of us, we're just going to want a high capacity autoloader, like any one of many different versions of a Glock. This one's a Model 22 in caliber 40 Smith & Wesson with a 15 shot magazine. There's also the Beretta 92FS 9x19 with a 15 shot magazine. And one of my personal favorites, the FN57 caliber 5.7x28 with a 20 shot magazine. Now, which one of the many types of high capacity autoloaders are really best? The best one would be whichever one allows you to hit what you are shooting at. But for anti-zombie purposes, there is one that is clearly better than all the rest. And when I say this, it has nothing to do with my bias and there is a very logical reason behind it, so bear with me. The clear winner for anti-zombie handguns, the Beretta 92FS. The reason being that as the zombies are making their uprising, they will be battled by our military. And when our very large, highly mechanized, very well-equipped military has lost that battle and it becomes incumbent upon you and three or four of your Halo buddies to win it for us, if you have a 92FS, there will be a lot of equipment laying around and you will be able to scavenge the military's ammunition and their magazines. And that same concept is what brings me to my absolute number one anti-zombie firearm is some version of an AR platform. In my case, a Colt AR-15A2. Caliber 5.56 NATO, the ammunition is powerful, but still compact and light. Typically uses 30-shot magazines, larger magazines are available. If correctly maintained, it's very reliable, it's very accurate. And, just like the pistol, when our very large, very well-equipped, very highly mechanized military has lost the battle, and you and your Call of Duty pals have to win it for us, there will be ammunition and magazines to be scavenged. But in terms of anti-zombie purposes, there's something very important about this format that you need to know. Let me show you what I mean. With my AR-15A2, I'm going to shoot the target on your left from 50 yards. And I'm not going to try for the headshot, I'm just going to shoot for the center of the target. And let's see what kind of results I get. Now that's me shooting offhand from 50 yards. And we can see that it's a pretty good group with one flyer, and yes, that is very annoying when that happens. But it shows us that both the rifle and I are pretty well dialed in. Now I'm going to shoot the target on your right from 7 yards, and let's see what happens. So we see at seven yards, I still have a fairly good group, but it's low. Why is that? That's because on most AR platform rifles, the sight is quite a bit above the barrel. Now what's happening is when you look through that sight at your target, your line of sight is straight. The arc of the travel of the projectile is not. And the barrel is not parallel to your line of sight. It's angled up a little bit. So at some point, that projectile will meet with your line of sight and what point that is will depend on at what distance you zeroed the rifle. I zeroed this at 100 so anywhere from 50 to 200 I'm going to be okay. So if I try to shoot a zombie in the head at 50 or 100 meters unless I miss it'll be dialed in. But we see at 7 yards it's going to hit low meaning if I'm trying to shoot a zombie in the brain I'm going to hit low and give him a maxiofacial injury. And of course, we know you can't really shoot zombies at distances of 50 or 100 yards. There'd be no fantasy drama in that. You have to shoot them at close distance while they're attacking. That's more exciting. And this wouldn't fare very well. Now, in reality, where I see this problem really manifest itself is when people are trying to hunt rabbits with an AR platform, and a rabbit jumps up at about 15 yards and he's running, and someone will continually shoot under him because he hasn't compensated for this.
Up till now, we've been having fun, but here's the boring part of the video where I talk. And the first thing I want to say is, if you take the possibility of a zombie apocalypse seriously, then you don't need any advice from me. You need advice from someone whose name ends in the letters MD. Now, my name sometimes ends in the letters CDA, Certified Dental Assistant. And with Halloween coming up very soon, I hear a lot of people discussing sugary snacks and candy and their relationship to dental decay. And I want to, as concisely as I can, explain a little bit of that. And it starts with a high-tech lesson on dental anatomy. Your tooth is hollow. In the pulp chamber, there's blood vessels and nerves. And then that's surrounded by a hard substance called dentin, which is surrounded by a far harder substance known as enamel. That's the hardest substance in your body. And that's what you see intraorally when you look in your mouth. What some people would call cavities, more accurately called carious lesions, are caused primarily by acid. Acid can erode a hole through that enamel and when it gets to the comparatively softer dentin, that decay can really spread. Sometimes we'll see someone fracture a cusp off and you'll see a lot of decay inside their tooth and they'll think that their tooth rotted from the inside out. No, you had a hole in your enamel. A lot of times that hole is interproximal between two teeth and you didn't even see it until it was far too late. That's one of the reasons we take dental x-rays to see between your teeth. So, how does the acid get in your mouth to cause carious lesions? Well, some of the things you consume, like orange juice, are very acidic. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't drink orange juice or grapefruit juice, but I am saying instead of sipping it for a long time, drink it, and then when you're done, rinse your mouth out with water. And of course, everything I'm saying is in addition to a regimen of brushing and flossing. Another terrible offender, soft drinks like Coca-Cola. Now this is California raspberry flavored Coca-Cola, but regardless of the specific type, one of the ingredients is phosphoric acid. We keep phosphoric acid on hand in the dental clinic for the purpose of etching your tooth enamel so that certain dental restorative materials will more efficiently adhere to it. We keep phosphoric acid in the dental clinic for the purpose of etching your tooth enamel, and it's an ingredient in Coca-Cola. But the main source of acid in your mouth are the bacteria that are in your mouth, and yes, Good hygiene can lower the number of bacteria, but they're still there. Living organisms, birds, fish, reptiles, mammals, bacteria, something they have in common is the elimination of waste. Take in nutrients, eliminate waste. I wouldn't say this in the clinic, but put bluntly, bacteria piss in your mouth. And the more nu nutrients you give them, the more sugar you give them, the more metabolism, the more bacteria, the more elimination of waste in your mouth. And where this relates to candy, especially Halloween type candy that you get while you're trick-or-treating, is some of it is the kind of thing that keeps the sugar in your mouth for a long time. Tootsie Pops and the myriad of other lollipops and suckers that are out there stay in your mouth for a long time. Therefore, the sugar is in your mouth for a long time, feeding the bacteria for a long time. Another terrible culprit are things that are sticky. They stay stuck to your tooth, again, feeding the bacteria for a long time. One source that I saw indicated that a group of laboratory rats was fed granulated sugar. Another group of rats was fed sugar-frosted flakes. Well, they may be great, but that group had a larger number of tooth decay because not only did they have the sugar, but those cornflakes keep it stuck to your teeth. The Halloween candy that are terrible offenders are any of the caramels, or the gummy bears, or things like dots. These things are terrible, and they're the kind of things that as a parent, you should throw away in your kid's Halloween candy. Right about now is when somebody asks me for advice on what kind of toothbrush they should get. The only advice I would give is, get a brush that has soft bristles. Now, some brushes are higher tech than others, and do they really work better? Think of it in terms of, some guns are higher tech than others, and do they really work better? Well, yeah, maybe. But in terms of shooting accurately, it's far more about the shooter than the gun. In terms of brushing efficiently, it's far more about the brusher than the brush. Now, flossing, that's a hassle, let's face it, but you really should do it. And it can be difficult to reach your back teeth, especially for anybody who's compromised and they have some kind of arthritis or something like that. This little device here helps me floss a lot better. Let me show you a close-up of it. This little device makes it very easy to get the floss between your teeth. And fold it back and you have a toothpick. 
fold it again, and the toothpick doesn't poke you while the thing's in your pocket. Brushing and flossing is something you should do at home. As far as everything else we did today, don't try that at home, I'm what you call a professional. Thanks for watching our top five anti-zombie guns video, and happy Halloween, everybody.